Hi guys and welcome to today's live hangout. I am so excited to be here today. Today we'll be talking about soup during National Soup Month and the Snapboard Winter Warm-Up. Now Emerald will be here today taking live questions. We also have some great participants who will be asking questions live and you at home can ask questions as well. Just make sure you log on to Google Plus or Twitter and ask the question using the hashtag soup in a snap so that I can see them and so Emerald can see them and so that we can get to your questions and we can get to as many of them as we possibly can. Now today is going to be really, really exciting. I cannot even tell you how thrilled I am to have the one and only Mr. Emerald Lagasse here with us cooking live. He's going to be doing some great soups and it really couldn't be more perfect considering it's like six degrees outside and it's freezing. So welcome chef. I'm so excited to have you today. Well, thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here, Laura, and uh, it's going to be an exciting, ex exciting chat. It definitely is, and we have some great participants. I've got some awesome bloggers. We've got Julie from Redhead Can Decorate. We have Kat from A Girl and Her Food, Melissa from Stockpiling Moms, Vanessa from Chef Druck, and Wendy from Around My Family Table. Welcome, ladies. Tell us a little bit about yourself and what you'd like to blog about. Hi, Laura. Hi, Emerald. Uh, my name Hello. is Julie. I'm from Redhead Can Decorate, and uh, my husband and I live in southeast Michigan, where it's also freezing today. Um, we have two children, and we have a little kitty cat named Sylvia. Um, my blog is all about DIY decorating and cooking, and if you look behind me, you can see my uh, DIY kitchen makeover that we completed a uh, about three years ago and that's what launched my blogging career and today if you can stop by my blog you'll be able to see Emerald's tomato soup. Awesome. That's Fantastic. awesome. Fantastic. Just a little cold there in Michigan. It's freezing. It's like uh, negative 14 wind chill. Woo! <laughs> Need yeah, some my, soup. My kids almost had off school today but they ended up having to go so they were really disappointed. Well, you just have to make them a big bowl of soup when they come home. Yes. <laughs> Kat, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? I think you're muted. Hi, guys. It's so nice to meet you. Um, nice I'm to Kat. Meet you. I live in Chicago. I like to blog about my recipes and food that I'm eating at restaurants in Chicago and while I'm, while I'm traveling abroad. When I'm not eating or cooking, I like to spend time with my adopted black cats and my boxers. We just adopted a beautiful boxer girl. We drove all the way to Kansas to rescue wow. her. Yeah. So I, my hands are my hands are full right now and it's kind of hard potty training with the uh, cold weather in Chicago. Oh. Yeah. I, I feel ya. You know you know, Kat, um, I, we adopted a boxer as well a year ago, oh. um, and yeah, when we we brought uh, we we brought him home from right outside of Detroit uh, to New Orleans, and uh, he, he's been wonderful. He was very frightened in the beginning, uh, but uh, he's adapted r very well and is really attached to my kids, and it's it's been a wonderful experience. So I good hear luck. The Thank you. I hear they're really good with kids. I don't have kids yet. Knock on wood. Hopefully soon. But I hear they're great with children, so they're I'm looking awesome. forward to that. They're awesome animals. Yeah, they're awesome animals. Cool. Awesome. Melissa? Hi, I'm Melissa Jennings. I live in Kentucky, and I blog at StockpilingMoms.com. Um, we're a food, travel, and lifestyle blog. And I also um, am gluten-free. I have celiac disease. So, Emerald, I, of course, love to follow your daughters. Yes. Have you? Did you have? Do you have the recent book? I the do. The second one. I do. Yeah, it's it's pretty good. It is. It's. I I'm have, really I had nothing to do with it. You don't. <laughs> they had a good role model. Well, thank you. Yeah, it was it was very difficult for me getting a handle on that because as young ladies, um, I had no idea about the disease and had no idea about anything you know related to gluten other than we consumed a lot of it. And, um, you know, basically, uh, Jilly uh, moved to the UK 
and that's where it really became apparent. And then they got tested, and so that's how that whole thing evolved. But uh, it's uh, it's very doable for sure. Awesome. And then we have Vanessa. Hi there. I'm thrilled to be here. Hi, I'm Vanessa. Vanessa. Hi. Uh, I'm Vanessa Druckmann, a French foodie mom of four, living in Chicago, and my blog is Chef Druck, French foodie mom. Grew up in France and have been in the States for a long time, but I still love um, all those French flavors, and that's what I try to do on my blog, is share family-friendly uh, French food. Excellent. I love that. And then last, but certainly not least, we have Wendy. Hi, I'm Wendy O'Neill from Around My Family Table, and I'm here in beautiful Phoenix, Arizona, where it's 80 degrees today, oh. so <laughs> it's going to be beautiful. And right now I'm focusing on uh, trans transitioning uh, my family to gluten-free, dairy-free foods because I'm allergic, and I think families need to have a good base of traditional foods that they can eat. Absolutely. And for those of you who might not know who I am out there, um, I am Laura Vitale. I host an online cooking show called Laura in the Kitchen. Um, and I've also, I also have my own program on cooking channel called Simply Laura. So hi and welcome. We've got a lot of cooking to do. I know Chef back there is ready and waiting. He's got some great soup recipes that are... Um, I'm reading, I was reading the recipes, Chef, and I'm, I'm thinking to myself, it could not be more perfect considering we just got a ton of snow, it's so cold, and you need something comforting, you need something delicious, soothing, warming, and your recipes are so easy, I think anyone blind could make them, basically. So tell me a little bit about your favorite comfort food, and I, I mean, I hear that soup is your favorite, one of your favorite comfort foods. Tell me a little yeah. bit about your, uh, your inspiration behind the Snapware winter warm-up recipes. Well, you know, um, I, I think probably most of you know that uh, I moved to New Orleans in 1982, uh, taking over Commander's Palace, and then uh, in 1990, uh, I opened my first restaurant, the flagship restaurant Emeralds, which is going to be 25 years old oh. this coming March. And why I bring that up is because I got in, reintroduced um, when I moved to New Orleans to soup. Uh, New Orleanians eat a lot of soup; they consume a lot of soup, and it doesn't matter if it's the heat of August or if it's the you know cold today in January. Uh, they just consume a lot of soup. So I, I took that in, back uh, and inherited back, and, and then my childhood memories began to start kicking off. I remember the very first soup that I made was with my mom. Uh, I was seven years old, standing on a, on a footstool. Uh, we made vegetable soup from the vegetables out of the garden. It wasn't very good, but I, <laughs> learned, uh, about, I learned about patience and about layering. Um, and then, you know, all of a sudden, soup has just become a, a serious part of my comfort and also my family. We're probably a two-soup-a-week uh, household, uh, and it ranges, you know, it, it, all, all over the board. It could be a bisque, it could be gumbo, it could be uh, split pea soup. The three soups that I created in conjunction with National Soup Month for Snapware, uh, a broccoli cheese soup, only because... In my self-poll that I did with my team, it seemed to be coming out of most people's uh, vocabulary that they like broccoli cheese soup. So I did a little rendition, a little version of mine. Uh, white bean, Tuscan white bean, and um, uh, broccoli rob, or you could use escarole, is another soup. We made tons of favorite. it yesterday. And then Creole, um, a, a, sort of a little Creole inspiration, but a little cream of tomato soup. We did last night for a group, and we served it with uh, prosciutto and truffle cheese, uh, grilled cheese, and it's just absolutely delightful. And like you guys in Chicago, and I, every, I think everybody's uh, pretty much cold around the country, what a perfect day for a hot bowl of soup. So, you know, I guess my memory uh, would probably start with clam chowder uh, growing up in New England, but... Um, you know, now uh, smoked chicken and andouille sausage gumbo Ooh. would be perfect right now with some rice. So uh, that's where I am. 
I'm loving it, loving it, loving it. So I know that you've got some cooking to do, and if you don't mind, I'm going to start asking some questions because we've got questions coming in from Twitter. Um, so guys, if you are tweeting or if you're on Google Plus asking questions, make sure that you use the hashtag soup and a snap so that I can see them and they'll pop up on my little iPad here. But we have a Twitter question coming from... Batances 99 and the question is is there an infallible technique when making broth for chef well um, I think keeping things simple is uh, is the best thing that you can possibly do um, broth or stock is really a major foundation of, obviously of soups and, and stews and and gumbo and and bisque etc cetera, etc cetera. so um, you know keeping it pretty simple uh, a maripois, uh, or ends of uh, those ingredients of a maripois, um, aromatics uh, like peppercorns, uh, and or uh, you know some herbs that you might like, uh, like thyme. I like to use thyme in a lot of my stocks, but you know there's nothing better than keeping it simple. Whether it's a chicken broth or chicken stock that you just take a whole chicken, rinse it really good, take the innards out, cover it with water, add some aromatics, add a maripois. Simmer it for you know uh, 30 to 45 minutes, and you got a chicken, uh, a perfect chicken broth. I'm also a big fan. I use a lot of shrimp stock. Um, I'm fortunate being in New Orleans and in the Panhandle of Florida that you know we have the ability to get pretty pretty much shrimp all the time, 12 months a year. Uh, there are always shrimp boats out there, so I keep it in a in a in a zip bag or in, or in snapware. And when I'm ready to have enough shells to make a stock. Cover it with water, aromatics, maripois, and in 30 minutes you got a, a, a an easy uh, seafood stock or shrimp stock as well. I do the same thing, and it's one of the um, to me you can buy shrimp already like shelled and deveined, and that's great. It's a great time saver, but I always feel like. I want the shells so that I can collect enough to make my own stock. That's like to me key to having a really flavorful broth or even sometimes I like to add a little bit of shrimp stock to like a sauce or something just to enhance the flavor. And I just think to me that's free to me that's free flavor. I was able to make that stock out of like whatever leftover herbs I have in the fridge, peppercorns, a good pinch of salt is crucial to me in any stock or broth making, and then the free shells that came from from my shrimp. So it's a win-win. Yeah, we're very fortunate, you know, uh, in where we live in by the Gulf Coast, uh, probably 8 months out of the year, there's a fresh shrimp uh, availability even just like people selling them in ice chests and you know, you're very fortunate to get them most of the time with the heads on. So yeah. when you add that component to the stock as well, you get this richness. Yeah, you get this richness, this more, even more intense flavor. Being a fisherman, that's kind of what I do when I'm not cooking, but that's pretty much every day that I cook. <laughs> um, I love also this. There's certain fish bones that work great that also can you can make uh, easy stocks. They freeze well, uh, as you guys know, um, and so. I encourage people, look, you know, go to uh, one of these inexpensive stores and buy a stack of ice cube trays, and when you're done making the stocks, just put them in the ice cube trays when they cool and freeze them, and they're easy to just pop out, Laura, like you were saying, when you just need a little intense flavor on mm -hmm. the fly, whether you're making rice or a risotto or whatever, it's, it, mm -hmm. it's really, really simple. It really is, and I think it's it's key to turning out some of the best food, and it's so, so simple and most of the time free because you're just using the leftovers of a roast chicken or the, the, the leftover shells or in the heads from shrimp or some fish bones and it's just it's phenomenal and I'm so excited that I'm so happy someone asked you that question because um, I think it's something that not a lot of people know about um, and I just think it's something yes. you should have in ice cube trays and in big tubs at all times in your freezer stocked up and ready to go. Oh. So do we have any questions from our participants? Yes, I have a question. Um, Emeril, um, we enjoyed your cream of tomato soup so much. Um, both my daughters are a little on the picky side, and they're not going to like that I said that, but um, <laughs> they are a little bit, and they like the Campbell's tomato soup. I know that's really bad, but they, um, they like that, and I wasn't sure if they would like this, but they really loved it, and I think what really um, took it over the top or kicked it up a notch was the balsamic vinegar and um, yes. 
And I, I wonder where that inspiration came from. Um, is that was that is that strictly you, or where'd that come from? Yeah, no, that's actually just me. I, I'm a big believer uh, believer that sometimes when you uh, combat uh, acidity with acidity, that the acidity washes out, uh, right. as opposed to getting getting stronger. I'm a big believer, particularly when I when I have sauces or when I'm making pastas of always squeezing a little bit of lemon juice like from a half a lemon into the dish at the end because it just sort of brightens it up and it it, it sort of just makes it pop and so when I um, was making it uh, the very first time I had fresh tomatoes and I got a lot of acidity and I thought you know what if I added balsamic vinegar to it mm. uh, which is aged then the sweetness of the balsamic not so much the acidity as opposed to adding sugar so many people have grown up with making a tomato based soup or sauce and they add sugar to it, raw sugar to it. And there are so many other things that you can do and balsamic vinegar is one of those things as well. If you were going to add a red wine vinegar or sherry vinegar it would be different but the balsamic because of it being aged, you know the process of balsamic is going larger to smaller and concentrating the flavor that's exactly what what it did and it, it combated a little bit of the acidity. Last night we made uh, a big batch uh, for a group. We used canned tomatoes, Italian tomatoes that we we you know squeezed by hand as opposed to buying strained or chopped. And it, the balsamic vinegar also helped that as well. It was absolutely delicious. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that your kids liked it. It's it's they also it. a very it's a very easy recipe and it's it also was. gluten free. Um, and um, uh, I had it last night and probably the prosciutto. And Fontina grilled cheese sandwich probably made it even better. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much for the recipe. <laughs> it was great. Wonderful. Absolutely. That sounds Thank amazing. Um, I have another question coming in from Twitter, and this question is from um, Isa. And they ask, what is a good method to freeze soup? Well, you know what? I would say that it's all about the storage container that you're using. And I have to say that... Um, I, I am, I'm kind of hooked on the snapware stuff. Uh, it's sort of at home. It changed uh, my pantry. Uh, having young kids, as you guys know out there, that um, you know, you get a lot of boxes. There's a lot of stuff. Everything these days is in this packaging, right? And so um, we eliminated a lot of the packaging, most of the packaging, and began putting it in snapware. And I got to tell you, it changed my pantry's life. Um, and uh, so for me, it's all about you know the food storage container. Yeah, I totally totally agree. And I will add one thing because I get this question asked a lot. If you're making a soup that that requires pasta or it's got some kind of rice or something to it, add it once. Don't make your soup up until the point of adding your pasta. Don't add it. Turn it off. Let it cool. Freeze it, and then when you reheat it, bring it to a boil. Then add some pasta because the pasta that's sitting in the liquid in the freezer for a long time will swell and will lose all of its texture, all of its flavor, and it really will kind of mess up the consistency of your soup. So that's the only thing I'm going to add. But I do agree 100%. Having good storage, having it organized, label, whatever you got to do will change the way you look at frozen or anything that you freeze, anything that you store. It just it's more yeah. it's even more visually appealing to me. I, I, I'll give you a little tip that I do at home um, and obviously I don't have a lot of sophisticated equipment at home as I do in the restaurants but when I when I make a soup particularly or even if I make like a, a, a red sauce or a red gravy whatever you want to call it after I, I, I'm done cooking it serving it eating it uh, or if I'm cooking it ahead of time even if I'm not going to freeze it then I put it in the refrigerator you gotta make sure that it's cool properly what I do is I add a few handfuls of ice cubes from my ice tray into the, into the soup or into the red gravy and that sort of cools it even more properly before I store it. It's not really going to affect as you would think it would affect the flavor or the taste or the depth of the flavor of that particular soup or gravy but what happens is when you bring it back the next day you're still going to get evaporation and concentration so what you did add as water is going to eventually evaporate and cook out anyhow. Part. That's a, an amazing tip I did not know about that I will start using right away. So that's a very good one. I never thought of that. 
But it makes sense. Yeah. It makes total, yeah, total absolutely. sense. Hmm. Okay. Well, now you got my wheels turning. See? Now you've got me thinking. Okay. I have one more question, and then I'll leave you to be for a little bit. I've got a question coming from Eileen from Twitter. And the question is, it's a good one. What is the best soup? But what's the best winter soup to make in a time crunch? When you have no time, you just have a few minutes to spare, you want something comforting, something warm, you want a bowl of soup, what's the best one to make in no time? Well, one that's very quick for me that I do a lot at home for my wife is uh, an egg drop soup. Uh, you can take box broth uh, and just heat it up. You can, uh, if you have, have time, you could add a little maripois to it or not. Uh, it takes on anything that you want to add to it from tofu to uh, to mushrooms to whatever and then you slur your your eggs and just put it in there and you you know really in about 10 15 minutes you could have you could have soup fabulous fabulous answer okay well I think if chef has any cooking to do, anything like that I will leave you be but I want to talk to our participants um, a little bit I want to ask uh, if you'll answer them one at a time so I don't get overwhelmed. What is your go-to winter soup or winter comfort food that you look forward to around this time of year? Uh, let's start with Kat. I'm obsessed with making broth. Um, I know it's a huge trend right now in New York with the Brodo that came out and everyone's sipping Brodo and it has so many benefits health-wise, immune building and it's so delicious, so easy to make, and I always sip it. Like especially today, I'm actually sipping some right now, awesome. and it helps. I stay healthy in the winter, and it warms my belly. So, broth. Awesome. What about you, Wendy? I'm going off off of order. You see that? I'm being I'm being a rebel. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, mine's not really a soup, though. I guess we tend to stick with chilies. We make mm -hmm. a ton of ton of chili. It's just so good and so easy. You can make it fast, you can make it slow, with only beans, with meat. It's very versatile. I totally agree. One of the best things about chili, for I love the flavor of chili. So I love that I can take those flavors and make, like, make the chili really, really thick and then stuff it in peppers or something. Absolutely. Or um, like which is probably not the healthiest thing in the world to do, but leftovers the next day. I love kind of heating it up in a skillet and cracking an egg on top. You should try it. It's oh, so good. Um, and I like like a carb-free breakfast. <laughs> to me. You see my excuses there? So, um, yeah, I do, I do have a soft spot for chili. And I love that you can make it vegetarian. You can make it white chili. You can make it really smoky with different peppers, with different spices. It's very versatile. And to your point, you can make it quick. You can make it slow cook. You can put it in the crock pot all day. You can even, mm -hmm. I put mine sometimes in my Dutch oven and just throw it in the oven and don't even worry about it. Let it cook for hours. And uh, it perfumes your home so nicely. And it's so warm and so cozy. I love it. OK, I'm going to ask a chef a couple of questions. Um, I want to know if you, if you have like picky children, and that's going back to Julie's kind of question earlier, if you have picky kids, who don't so much love soups with like tons of celery and onions and chunks of carrots. I have twin brother and sister who are teenagers, and nowadays if, that, if something's colorful and chunky, they want nothing to do with it. So uh, my question is, if you've got picky kids who look at something and they said there's too many chunks of things, what's a good um, what's a good soup option for them? Because I know you can puree things, but is there something in mind that you might have in mind that might work well that won't let that won't make the parents go nuts having to make a separate dish for the kids. I, you know, I had a, a, a an experience not long ago where um, uh, I let my kids choose some of their favorite vegetables, and of course, corn came out uh, as one, and potato came out. So um, we we sort of I, I I sort of did this spin on a very easy recipe called Mexican soup even though that it's not really from Mexico or anything really other than it has a little bit of ch chili powder and cumin. But I use ground turkey, which they love, and broth, of course, and that, those spices that I just said, and salt and pepper. And I just put tons of corn and potatoes in it, and we started there. Uh, from there, uh, you know, the following week, I, I added another, another vegetable. I added <laughs> onion, and, and then, I, then I added onion and celery. And it, be, it starts to become familiar to them in steps and in time. Uh, so if you're not going to puree something, 
that's a good way to do it and certainly to involve them in that. But of course the almighty, if you're trying to get them to eat a lot of vegetables, is to puree it and, and then put something like corn kernels in it if they like corn in it so that they can disguise that but they can't disguise what you pureed. It's a great tip. So basically ask them what their like latest favorite vegetable is, like their latest favorite flavor combo and then just work from there. I have to say what works well for me when I'm cooking for my siblings is pureeing things. Like I make, my grandmother makes a delightful pot of chicken pastina but she puts butternut squash in and tons of vegetables right. that my siblings will probably scream running but I, pure, I, put, I pass it through a food mill actually so it's really creamy, really velvety, tons of flavor and they gobble it up, a good grating of parmesan on top and they're, they're thrilled. So I said yeah, puree I, it. I, I, you know an, another example uh, uh, during the holidays that I did is that um, most people like sweet potatoes and so um, I made a root vegetable soup that I, that had you know parsnips and it had butternut squash and acorn squash uh, it had of course sweet potatoes regular potatoes carrots long story short um, by the time you puree that it, and it turns orange I just said it was a sweet potato soup and uh, and 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 everybody thought it was delightful Oh, that's brilliant. Why, 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 yeah, why I say that is because if you say butternut squash, most kids are going to like put their nose up and go, uh -huh. oh, butternut squash, what, what's that, you know? I know. And then you tell them about acorn squash, and my sister tends to think that acorn squash is a decoration, by the way. She does not believe right. that that's something edible. <laughs> so when I once roasted it, I roasted uh, acorn squash, and I put roasted pine nuts on top. It was delightful. She looked at me. She says, why are you cooking decorations? <laughs> and I said, what are you talking about? She says, why are you cooking that? So I don't even, half the time, I don't even tell them what's in things. I just, I disguise it by pureeing it. I make a nice gratin um, out of things. And they just, like, I, she, they do like sweet potatoes. So I'm, I can get away with the orange thing because they think it's sweet potatoes and it's fine. Or carrots. They can deal with carrots unless it's cubes. Then it's not so much. But point is, puree it. You'll be fine. That's the point of the story. Okay. I have a question coming from Twitter from Eza, and the question is, what is a good soup to store in a fridge without the flavor changing? Well, I mean, um, I, I'm sure you guys could answer the, the question as well. Uh, I, don't, I don't really think uh, if you're using good ingredients, straightforward broth, that really the, the, the change of flavor is not going to happen unless you intentionally do that. Um, you know the comment earlier about chilies and adding different peppers to it whether they're chipotle which is you get smokiness and heat or whether it's pobleno and you're just getting you know flavor um, I, I don't really most soups that I cook are pretty pretty straightforward I, I think it comes down to your storage container yeah well if you gotta store it that's for sure yeah. and that's another reason why I like snapware because mm -hmm. they don't stain you know a lot of food containers that I have and I have a, I have others too I'm, I'm not gonna say that I just have snapware but I have other food containers but they don't hold up and they they tarnish um, and and I have problems with most of them if you're gonna microwave something too not that I'm a big microwave guy but my wife does Mm, and that brings me to a good question. Um, tell me about uh, Snapware, and can you microwave things in Snapware containers? <coughs> yes. Um, yeah, the great thing about Snapware that I love about it is there's two designs now. There's the hard plastic design with the plastic lids that are color coordinated, and then they just came out with a Pyrex base with the same lid. So not only are they freezable, they're also microwavable, they're also dishwasher safe, they're airtight and they don't leak and they don't tarnish. So with that mouthful, that sold me for sure. Well, yeah, because first of all, the fact that the, the lid fits on both is crucial to me because I, <laughs> I am the queen of having mismatched lids and containers because I can't keep track of what goes with what and I, I just want to make things easy. So this is perfect because the lid works on both, correct? Uh, the lids fit on both, whether they're, they're the Pyrex one or whether they're the hard plastic one. 
Uh, they're in a, they're interchangeable as well. They're stackable, which is another thing I like because I don't know about you guys, but most pantries that I go in, including mine before, it's a mess because there's so many food storage containers and different food storage containers. None of them stack. They're all over the place. They take up all this room. The great thing that I love about Snapware as well is that they're stackable. I totally agree. I'm I'm afraid to open up my my pantry cabinet half the time because I'm afraid they're gonna fall <laughs> and hit me in the face. Yeah. Because <laughs> there's like so yes. many different kinds. So that's like the answer to everyone's problem. And I love that the Pyrex one can go from the fridge or from the freezer, let it thaw, and you can just throw the thing in the oven. You can microwave it if you want to. It's one-stop shop. And if you're really busy coming home from work after a long day and you've got some soup already made, I mean. There you have it. You have no cleanup to do. It's super easy. I love it. Well, if you have, you know, a lot of times, too, they work really, really well, particularly like in, in this size here. Um, and that is is because, let's just say, like we were talking about earlier, that I on Sunday I want to make a red gravy, and I have meatballs and sausage in it, et cetera, et cetera, whatever, okay? But I really, I'm really looking something. What am I going to do Tuesday night, you know? So... I can take some of that and make it make it into some bolognese or, or a, a meat ragu, but use a different type of pasta, and then you can easily do a different dish using the same base and store it in this, and it's not going to go anywhere because they're so airtight. And then come uh, Tuesday, um, you know, my wife just takes this out of the refrigerator and pops it in the oven uh, for 45 minutes, and uh, away we go. Uh, of course, you, you can't do that with the with the plastic lid. And I don't recommend microwaving uh, any of them with the with plastic lids as well. And you wouldn't do that anyhow with most food storage containers. Correct. Um, do we have any any questions from our bloggers for the chef? Yeah, I, I want to get back to. Okay. Oh, sorry. My question was: um, I made your Tuscan white bean soup, which was phenomenal. Um, and I love. Did putting you use broccoli, Rob? I sure did. Got to get those vegetables yeah. in, and I love using great, the. It's great with escarole too. Mhm. Mm yeah, and maybe we'll even try it with a little kale. Go crazy. Yes. Um, yes. I love using the Parmesan rind as a way to boost the flavor, and I'm wondering. I'm sure you have more flavor boosting tips up your sleeve for soup, and I'd love to hear some. Well, you know, in this particular recipe that you all have for the Tuscan white bean soup. There was no protein. There was no, other than the beans, there was no meat. Um, a lot of times what I do to change it up is I add either sweet or hot Italian sausage to it. Mm -hmm. I take, uh, a, a, make a little bit incision in the casing and just kind of take the sausage out and use it as like sort of a ground meat. Um, I, I've done uh, chicken with it where I just take uh, chicken thighs or chicken breast and chop them up without the skin and brown that. Uh, as well inside of the inside of the soup has, has worked really really good for me as well and um, you know I've also this is gonna sound crazy to you guys but you know by using a, 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 a sprig or two of the rosemary in there and then taking it out sometimes I will add a little bit more ra uh, rosemary and I'll use lamb or ground lamb mm. and it also gives it a whole different direction particularly when you have the lemon juice Finished with the olive oil and the Parmesan Reggiano cheese, it's dynamite. Mm, sounds mm. delicious. That does sound delicious. And you know, I make a, a, a bean soup very similar to that, but that's like my bean soup when I have absolutely no time at all on my hands or any greens. I always have a couple cans of cannellini beans, and you can always find some kind of pesto in my freezer. I store it in um, ice cube trays. And uh, I just right. pop one out, stir that in, add a handful of ditalini, a little parmesan on top, and it is to die for. To die for. So you can really change things up so many different ways. Yes. You know, and you know what, ladies, I, I, I will say this too. You know, I'm a creature of habit. So, you know, I kind of grew up where, you know, I would take my beans and soak them overnight. And uh, as I have here and... You know, I'm, I'm, I've been stuck on that. I guess maybe that's the restaurant as well. But i got to tell you, there's nothing wrong with canned beans either for, for time-saving, mm -hmm. uh, as a time-saving tip. Uh, as long as, for me, 
as long as you rinse them slowly wow. in the cold water and eliminate some of that stuff that's in the can, the beans itself are, are, are really, for the most part, the quality is up there. It is. And I think what's even, for me anyway, what I love doing, I like to keep a couple cans on hands just in case, but the best thing my grandma taught me uh, years ago is you take one of those big soup pots, you take a couple of one pound bag of beans at a time, you soak them, you part boil them so that they're about halfway cooked to three quarters of the way, drain them, rinse them completely, and then store them in containers, store them in the freezer, and you have cooked beans already ready. So I like to have black beans, yep red kidney beans and cannellini beans and chickpeas because those took the longest to cook. I like to have those always ready because I like to use them in chilies or in soups or even a cannellini bean and tuna salad or something. It's just a good thing to have on hand, um, instant, in instant protein as well. Well, going back to uh, our friend who was talking about chilies and the versatility of ch chilies, I totally agree with you 100%. I recently just went to... Um, uh, a 14 year old uh, birthday party and they had a chili party they actually had three different chilies uh, in slow cookers that they were serving folks in different condiments they had like a chili bar and it was really really interesting and I really didn't never thought about it and I, you know here I was I got some great ideas uh, they had a white chili with with chilies uh, they had a traditional bean red uh, chili and they had a vegetarian chili It was absolutely awesome so I'm with you on the chilies. Sounds amazing. <laughs> That's a great, um, great tip. So, ladies, if any of you have questions, please feel free to ask them. Um, don't feel like you need a specific time. If you've got any questions for the chef, please feel free to ask because I'm sure that he is more than happy to answer whatever you got. I have I another. Have, I have one too. Oh. I, uh, Go ahead. I have. We all do. <laughs> I have a reader who asked, what do you do if you accidentally put too much salt in your soup? Yeah, it happened to me not long ago. Actually, it just, sometimes you just, you know, particularly when you're layering, you know, I like to layer flavors, so, you know, season, reseason, reseason, etc. And uh, it was actually the broccoli cheese soup that uh, I, I tasted it before I pureed it, and I was like, oh, God, this is a little bit salty. I added a potato. I added a peeled potato diced and didn't change anything. It actually kind of gave it a little velvety flavor. Uh, so I, I, most of the time I would add potato. I've been in the situations where I've added cooked rice uh, as well, particularly if you're gonna if you're gonna uh, puree it or not. But it does work as well. So um, that's that's the thing. You can always add more broth, uh, but then you don't have the consistency unless because if you reduce it you're still going to get evaporation and concentration and flavor, so the salt's going to come back. So I find a potato works best. Oh, great. That's a really great tip. Thank you. I have another one, another question about um, for saturated fat in the tomato soup. Um, we had to put the, uh, I had to force myself to put the cup of heavy cream in it, and um, I say that as a joke. Um, it, was, it was wonderful with it. Um, but is there a way to make it less saturated fat? Uh, my husband is on a very low saturated fat diet, so um, he did have yeah. a little bit, but is there a, is there a way yeah, to I mean, make it less fat? Yeah, I mean, you can, you can do a few things. You can eliminate it totally. Uh, it's not going to be as velvety. Uh, right. You can increase the olive oil um, when you're, particularly if you're, if you're pureeing it with a hand mixer, uh, that works into it, good olive oil, works into it really, really well. Mm -hmm. um, I've been in a situation where um, I, I was cooking for some folks and they wanted a tomato-based soup, but they were really concerned, um, as probably your husband, about the saturated fat and about the cream. Right. So I used, I used a, a, non, a plain yogurt I used, okay. and I got, that, I got that sheen and I got that velvetiness in my right. palate that I was looking for without it being heavy cream. That sounds that sounds like a great idea. Yep. What I've done what I've done to um, to cut down on the cream when I'm whenever I'm making a bisque or a soup, I going back to a 
a previous question actually, I like to add a potato or two because that gives me a really beautiful velvety consistency and then all I do is just finish it off at the end with like a quarter cup of cream rather than a whole cup right. and I still get that velvety creamy consistency that a, a beautiful creamy bisque or soup should have uh, but it's not adding mm -hmm. so much and if you're only adding like a quarter cup and your soup can serve up to six to eight people now you're talking less than a tablespoon per person right um, but it does it does Adding it does make a difference, in my opinion. You don't have to add a lot, but a little bit goes a long way. I made a broccoli, a cream of broccoli soup um, not too long ago, and I used the potato as my thickening agent. I used the potato for that beautiful texture and just finished it off with just a hair of cream. Not a lot, just a little tiny bit, just to give it a little bit of body, a little bit of velvetiness, a little bit of that something that coats the roof of your mouth like a good creamy soup should. So that's my tip. Great idea. That's also a great idea. Thank and I you. also know this might change the flavor a little bit um, right. in certain soups. I have a friend of mine who does very low carb, and she took my broccoli soup, and instead of adding potatoes, she added cauliflower, and it worked the same way. So there's a good tip for that. Yeah, great tips. Okay, so I think we are almost near our time, um, and I wanted to ask the chef uh, one, one last question because I – I love this. Um, why is it necessary to mash up some of the beans in your Tuscan bean soup? Uh, can you repeat that? I'm sorry. Why is it necessary to mash up some of the beans in your white bean soup, in your Tuscan bean soup? Um, I, I just, it's, it's it just, it's the same thing like putting the Parmesan cheese rind. Mm -hmm. um, do you save your rinds? Of course. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm a big fan of that. I, uh, I use a lot of Parmesan Reggiano cheese at home, um, uh, and I always save the rinds in a, in a, in a, either in Snapware or a Zip bag, and um, I think it adds tremendous flavors to, to certain things. Um, you know, the broccoli rob was just uh, because it, would, it was beautiful, and so that's what went in it. I, as I said earlier, other greens can be in there as well from from shod to kale to, you know, to escarole. Um, when I can find, it's where where I live uh, in the south, escarole is not very popular. So it's, it's um, you know, you, you can get it once in a while. It's not consistent in the, in the grocery stores, uh, unfortunately. Um, for some reason, chicory is, but not, uh, not escarole. Yeah, when it's available, I like to get my hands on it uh, because I I, uh, I love it. I grew up eating escarole, so to me, it's a very familiar, comforting flavor. Um, and when I can yes. find it, I grab it so I can make it sautéed with, like, uh, olives and garlic and hot pepper flakes. I can put it in a soup. Oh, I can I stuff it. it in pizza. I love escarole. Oh, okay. We have questions. We have time for one more question, uh, and I would like for one of our bloggers to go ahead and ask, one last question for our chef, and then we will be ready to wrap it up. I have a question to ask. Uh, with you guys saving the Parmesan rinds, do you guys ever make broth or stock for it, to, for your recipes? Yes. Yes, I do. It's delicious. It's, and what? The, it's the best. It's like the, for me, I like to put it in just, the, if I do a, a simple vegetable broth, like just basic, uh, aromatics, basic herbs, peppercorns, a good pinch of salt. Put that Parmesan rind in there, let it simmer for a bit, and it's got the most incredible, intense flavor, and that will be the best base for minestrone you will ever have. I guarantee it. Yeah, I'm going to start doing that. That, that, that broth uh, for minestrone would be phenomenal and is phenomenal, but I also, I do, uh, sometimes I roast it, sometimes not. I make a cauliflower soup that I use that, mm. that Parmesan rind broth in that is absolutely fantastic and I finish it again as I was saying early with with lemon juice and a little bit of lemon zest it's absolutely delicious oh my goodness that sounds that sounds phenomenal well thank you ladies thank you to our participants for being here it was an absolute pleasure you guys make sure you check them out they are all absolutely lovely and it was wonderful being able to chat and having the opportunity to meet you um, in person <laughs> Face to face. Well, Laura, um, thank you, thank you so much for hosting. And uh, ladies, it's been a pleasure. Uh, thank you for sh sharing this with us. 
Well, thank you so much to Emerald for uh, hanging, to take the time. You know, you took the time to hang out with us today, and we really, really appreciate it. And now you have the opportunity to hang out at one of his restaurants. Now, what you want to do is go to facebook.com slash snapware and enter to win the snapware winter warm-up sweepstakes that's going on from now through January 31st. The grand prize winner will receive a trip to Orlando, Florida, escape the cold, <laughs> complete with a meal at Emeralds Orlando, tickets to local attractions, and a snapware product prize pack, and so much more. And also, if you want to get more winter warm-up soup recipes, make sure you check out facebook.com slash snapware. It'll all be there waiting for you. I hope you guys had a great time. A big round of applause for our chef and our participants for asking great questions. And I hope that it was somewhat helpful to you. Uh, if you had any questions when it came to soup making, I hope that this was helpful. And now what I want you to do after you enter in your sweepstakes, make sure you make something comforting. Make sure you make a big pot of soup. Store it well because we have got some cold days and nights ahead of us. Thank you so much for watching. I wish you all good luck entering the sweepstakes. And um, if you do, if you are the lucky winner, to go ahead and get to Orlando, tweet some pictures of your warm getaway so that I can sit back, drool, and be jealous of your wonderful time that you're having while we're all stuck here in the freezing cold. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you soon. Bye.